Evet, merhabalar. Ben sözü İvo Hoca'ya bırakayım. Merhabalar, hoş geldiniz. E, bugünkü Domino Lecture'ımız e, güzel, ilginç geçecek. E, yavaş yavaş sanırım e, katılımcılar gelmeye başlıyor. 9 kişi şu anda live. Biraz daha bekleyelim isterseniz Erkan Hocam. Bu evet. arada Didem Hoca'ya da e, hoş geldiniz demek istiyorum. Hoş bulduk. E, Didem Hoca'yı sanırım bu yılın başında da bir misafir etmiştik ama online yine e, şeyde IPCC konferansında. Evet. Ben de, e, Didem Hoca'nın oradaki e, sunumunu dinledikten sonra uzun zamandır Domino Lecture'a davet etmek istiyordum. Tamam dedim şimdi güzel bir vesile. Öyle bir e, ondan tekrardan hoş geldiniz. Çok teşekkür ederim. Hoş bulduk. Ben çok mutlu oldum davet için. Bilgi Üniversitesi'ne evet. tekrar. Zaten Bilgi Üniversitesi'ne daha önce sunduğum e, o çalışmaları bir lekçe haline getirmek ve keyifli bir şey oldu aslında. Hepsini bir araya getirmiş oldum. Evet, evet. Ben de heyecanlıyım. Erkan Hoca'ya da hoş geldin. E, Erkan Hoca da değil mi? Sosyal Kafa. Evet, hoş bulduk. Bize, bize evet. Bizleri misafir ediyor bugün. Domino Lekçevcileri. Her zaman kapımız açık size zaten. <gülüyor> ah, Aslı Hoca da evet. yorumlardan e, selam vermiş. Ona da Aslı Hoca'mıza da ha. selam buradan. Evet Aslı Tabii Hoca'mıza da merhaba. Siz de hoş geldiniz. Evet. Ee, ben geri çekiliyorum. Buyurun. Tamam. O zaman yavaş yavaş başlayalım dilerseniz. E, bence değil mi? 5 dakika geçti. İyi bir süre. E, ben e, hemen o zaman hızlıca Didem Hoca'yı e, bir tanıtayım. E, tanıtırken de İngilizce'ye geçeceğim. Çünkü Domino'da geçirim biraz daha özünde İngilizce sunum var ve sun, İngilizce konuşmak olduğu için ben de doğrudan şimdi yavaş yavaş İngilizce'ye geçeceğim. E, so Didem, welcome once again this time in English. E, so Didem Sezen is a lecturer at Teesside University, e, MIMA School of Art and Design. Her research focuses on the history, theory, and practice of interactive media, digital culture, and transmedia storytelling. She holds a PhD from Istanbul University, and she was awarded a Fulbright scholarship for her doctoral studies at the Georgia Institute of Technology, School of Digital Media. She was involved in EU-funded research projects in Germany and studied the implementation of interactive storytelling and gamification for cultural heritage practices and educational settings. She co-edited three books and published book chapters, journal articles, conference papers, and encyclopedia articles from publishers including Rutledge, Springer, LIT Verlag, and Palgrave Macmillan. So a warm welcome to Didem Sezen. And the talk of uh, the title of today's talk is Exchanging Looks with Machines, a critical discussion of data-driven visual practices. So Didem, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Now the let me share my screen, then I will be all right. Sure. Um, okay. Can you can you see my screen now? No. Just yes, it. yes, we can see now. Yes, we can, yeah. Perfect. From now on, I cannot see you, but only my screen. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening, everyone. Good evening in Istanbul. For me, it's still afternoon. Uh, thank you very much uh, for, for this invitation. And thank you very much to you for attending uh, this virtual lecture. Um, today, I am going to talk about uh, data-driven visual culture. Um, machine vision technologies, basically, and we'll discuss how our um, human vision-driven visual culture um, become just a small fragment uh, of the contemporary visuality. So some of the concepts and examples that I'm going to discuss today, uh, I previously uh, presented them in the academic conferences and seminars uh, organized by Istanbul Bilgi University. So I will try to recompile them uh, as a lecture for um, Istanbul Bilgi University media and communication system graduate students. Um, so let's start. So um, even though today I'm focusing on machine vision, at the same time as, it, as a twist of fate maybe, uh, in my daily life in the last uh, couple of days, uh, I'm having some serious problems with my vision, my eyesight. Uh, I, I use screens uh, for just about everything, uh, to work, to relax, or just to 
keep up with daily life. And my eyes, probably like many of you, uh, feel dry and tired. And my vision gets blurry by the end of the day. So this little eye drop bottle is a good friend. Uh, so I'm dedicating the start of this presentation uh, to, to my declining human vision. And I'll start with it. The, the fragility of human vision is so true. <laughs> we, we are experiencing it. Um, do, you, do you know uh, what caused um, digital eye strain? Normally, we blink about 12, uh, 20 times in a minute. And uh, that spreads tears evenly over our eyes and which keeps them uh, from getting dry and irritated. So, but, but researchers have found that people blink less than half as often when they are reading, watching or playing on a screen. Um, blinking is a very natural involuntary action. This is my university ID in the very first day of my job at Teesside University. Uh, they, they took a picture of me. Um, obviously, I'm not sleeping here. I just blinked. Um, we, we humans blink a lot throughout the day. To be very precise, uh, in one minute, we blink about 15, 20 times. And uh, this means we blink about 1,200 times in an hour and about 28,800 times in a day. So this also means that in our waking hours, we spend 10% of the time with our eyes closed. Funny and interesting, right? So we blink uh, to take a momentary rest to our eyes, uh, but more importantly, to our brain. Both our eyes and our thoughts take a momentary break to refocus better later. Uh, I have written a short commentary piece uh, about a journal project by a big university IPCC group, uh, and the title was Without a Blink. And uh, what does without a blink means? Uh, we have the same idiom in Turkish, gözünü kırpmadan. It means that without having or displaying any sort of emotional response. So I use this idiom in my title to point out the machine vision technologies uh, because they're executing without an emotional response, without an interruption, without losing time, without tiring, without dust, without eye irritation. It's constant seeing, not blinking uh, is not humane. So we are talking about a different kind of vision. Um, and the second thing about human vision is that it is subjective. Um, I'm sure many of you recognize this dress very well from 2015, right? Um, it's funny though, when I was preparing this presentation, I was seeing the dress um, white and gold, and now I'm seeing it uh, black and blue. <laughs> it's weird, but this was a, an internet phenomenon in 2015. Uh, let me give you a very short background of this image. Um, about a week ago, a wedding in Scotland, uh, the bride's mother goes shopping for her mother of the bride dress, and she finds out some options and takes some pictures and sends some uh, to her daughter to, to ask uh, which one is the best. So the daughter says, the white and gold one is good. And the mother says, no, it's not white and gold, it's blue and black. Mom, that's white and gold. So the daughter shows the image to, to her fiance and the fiance agrees with the mother, poor guy. And they are, they are living uh, in a very small island. I think it was Colonse in, in Scotland. And for a week, uh, the debate became well known in Colonse in a small island community. And um, on the day of the wedding, one of the friends of the couple posted the image uh, to her Tumblr account and posted the same question to her followers and it spread around the web so quickly. And within a week, more than 10 million tweets had mentioned the dress using hashtags uh, such as hashtag dress, hashtag black and blue, hashtag white and gold. Um, I don't uh, what you see, uh, I don't know what you see at the moment, uh, but um, celebrities with larger Twitter followings began to weigh in. Taylor Swift, for example, she said that she saw it as blue and black. The whole thing left her confused and scared. And Justin Bieber agreed that the dress was blue and black. And while um, Anna Kendrick, Kate Perry, Julian Moore, they all saw it as white and gold. 
And Kim Kardashian, she tweeted that she saw it as white and gold, while her husband Kanye West saw it as blue and black. So, and um, this is the science behind the dress. Researchers uh, from different countries and institutions, they looked at the science behind the dispute. And their conclusion was each person's internal model reacts differently. So the people who saw the dress as white and gold did so because their internal model presumed um, they were observing the dress under a blue sky and they discount the color blue. For people uh, who saw blue and black, their internal models primed them to think they were weaving the dress under orange light. So we see here that the brain's involvement in seeing starts before we even see anything. Um, in her book, uh, A History of Seeing, Susan Denham Waite, um, based on this example, this dress example, she said that the sense of commonality about what we see is an illusion. Two people may have identical visual capabilities um, they can see the same thing, but no two people do see the same. Every aspect of visual perception is subjective, unique to the perceiver. So vision is a pathway, an information processing system from the way the eyes get a visual information to analyzing its components, to building up a conscious perception of sight and recognizing the scene being observed. Um, Visual perception studies um, also showed us that um, a person's cultural background influence uh, how they see. So there's actually evidence uh, that until modern times, humans didn't actually see the color blue. That's when scholar William Gladstone, who later went on to be the prime minister of Great Britain, uh, he noticed that in the Odyssey, um, Homer describes the ocean as vine dark and some other strange hues, but he never uses the word blue. And um, a few years later, uh, a philologist, um, I mean, someone who studies language and words, uh, he called, he was called um, Lazarus Greiger, and he decided to follow up uh, on this observation and he analyzed ancient Icelandic, Hindu, Chinese, Arabic, and Hebrew texts uh, to see if they, if they use the color. And he found no mention of the word blue. Um, when you think about it, it's not that crazy. Other than the sky, there isn't really much in nature that is inherently a vibrant blue. In fact, um, the first society to have a word for the color blue was the Egyptians, the only culture that could produce blue dyes. Uh, from then, it seems that um, awareness of the color spread throughout the modern world. Um, but we can ask, just because there was no word for blue, does that mean our ancestors couldn't see it? Um, I find this quite interesting. There have been various studies I, um, they conducted um, to, to try uh, to work this out, but one of the most compelling uh, one was published in 2006 by Jules Davidoff. Uh, he's a psychologist from Goldsmiths University of London. And Jules Davidoff and his team, uh, they worked uh, with the Himba tribe from Namibia. And in their language, there is no word for blue and no real distinction between green and blue. And to test uh, whether, that, um, whether that meant they couldn't actually see blue, he showed members of the tribe a circle with 11 green squares and one obviously blue square. Um, well, I think, like me, it's obvious to us, to all of you, at least as, as you can see on the right side of the slide, uh, but the Himba tribe, they struggled to tell Davidov which of the squares was a different color to the others. And some uh, did some guesses, some hazard guesses uh, at which square was different, but it took a long time to get the right answer. And there were a lot of mistakes. But interestingly, the Himba have lots more words for greens. 
Uh, so to reverse the experiment, uh, Jules Davidoff uh, showed English speakers the same circle experiment with 11 squares of one shade of green and then one odd square of a different shade. Uh, as you can see on the left side on the slide, uh, it's pretty tough for us to distinguish which square is different. In fact, I really can't see any difference at all. So the, the Himba tribe, um, the, the Himba tribe actually, they could spot the, the, the odd square straight away. So for your interest, it is the one orange arrow points. Um, another study by MIT scientists uh, in 2007, um, it showed that native Russian speakers uh, who don't have one single word for blue, but instead have a word for light blue and dark blue, uh, I think it's Goldoboy and Thinny, and they can discriminate between light and dark shades of blue much faster than English speakers. Uh, so we can talk many more features of human vision, of course. Um, they're all fascinating, but I know that we are here to speak about machine vision and uh, assure you how machines see are fundamentally uh, different from us. Uh, this is Google's privacy terms, uh, and it, it expla explains uh, the principles of uh, machine vision technologies in a simple, straightforward manner. Um, it says, uh, when you look at a photo, you might see your best friend standing in front of her house from a computer's perspective. Um, the sa that same image is simply a bunch of data that it may interpret uh, interpreted as uh, shapes and information about color values, while a computer won't react like you do when you see that photo, a computer can be trained to recognize certain patterns of colors and shapes. For example, a computer might be trained to recognize the common patterns of shapes and colors that make up a digital image of a landscape, such as a beach or an object like a car. Actually, this, this description reminds me this very cool scene um, from one of my favorite childhood movies, The Terminator, uh, James Cameron's film, The Terminator, uh, it, it introduced an interesting visual effect that allowed audiences to get inside the head and behind the eyes of the Terminator. Um, it is called Thermovision, and it is basically a scene uh, filmed from the T-800's point of view. Uh, and uh, what makes the Terminator vision special is that um, the camera's view is overlaid with informatics concerning background data, potential dialogue choices, and threat assessments. So we see here that a cyborg from the future would need to identify threats and then have contingency plans in case um, the threat exceeds a certain threshold. Uh, in the same way, it makes, uh, it makes sense uh, that um, a cyborg would perform visual scans and analyzing uh, analysis of the objects around him. So this popular representation of thermovision, I think, prepared us for today's visual culture. Um, this image is not from Terminator movies. This is what Tesla's autopilot sees on the road. Uh, Tesla has released footage of what, is, what its um, um, autopilot system actually sees when it's scanning the road in the course of um, autonomous driving. So as you see here, autopilot maps out objects and distances in real time, um, all being monitored constantly uh, to ensure the car doesn't go off the rails. Um, sorry. Yeah. So, um, and the, also uh, using uh, network cameras uh, positioned around the car, um, the software is um, able to detect objects and decide how far away they are. And it acts on that information using uh, car inputs like networks uh, that can learn about unique driving situations of nearly uh, 1 million Teslas throughout the world in real time. So this means that while a Tesla can learn about its direct surroundings using the cameras attached to the car, it can also draw information 
um, that's being gathered by other Teslas around the world to, to best decide what it should do. Um, these images generated by fictional Terminator, Thermovision, or actual Tesla Vision, I think um, they're, they're what filmmaker Harun Faroqi calls as operational image. Um, the operational image is the product of intelligent machines capable of performing tasks independently and automatically. The operational images function various roles. It registers, it maps, uh, it interacts with, controls, regulates the parameters of a new visual space that is the product of a new kind of non-human vision, machine vision. Um, when I was a student in film and television school, John Berger's Ways of Seeing was one of the most recommended books uh, as part of uh, visual culture classes. I'm still recommending that book. Ways of Seeing was basically about um, how we humans see things, paintings, photographs, movies, TV programs, news images, uh, advertisements, postcards, and the, the shared feature of all these different types of visual elements was that they were all aimed for human vision. They all have representational value and they require human eye to make sense of it. But these images, the operational images, they belong to a different visual culture. These are not necessarily visible to the human eye in the way um, the, the, the conventional images are. If you are living in a city, every time you attempt to walk outside on the street, you can be sure that your image will be captured by surveillance cameras, traffic cameras, someone else's Instagram stories, or um, maybe by the thermal camera drone of by Fatih Ilçevniyeti. Uh, Fatih District uh, Police Department, um, the, the, the police teams, they conducted a smoking ban inspection with a thermal camera drone in Eminönü Square. And police drone with thermal camera was used in this inspection. People with high fever were detected with a drone, with a thermal camera. Um, and unmasked people and smokers, they were identified and warned by drone. Um, this is another example of machine vision I found about this on Financial Times. Um, these are the students of a secondary school in Hong Kong. And um, almost um, all students for most of the past year, they have been attending classes from home. But unlike most children around the world, these kids, um, they, they, um, they are being they, they were being watched as they sit at their desks by a software called Four Little Trees, an artificial intelligence program that claims it can read the children's emotions as they learn. So the program's goal is to help teachers make distance learning more interactive and more personalized by responding to an individual student's reactions in real time. So this algorithm, um, it works by measuring micro movements of muscles on the girls' faces and attempts to identify emotions such as happiness, sadness, uh, anger, maybe surprise, fear. So according to the company, um, the algorithms generate detailed reports. So regarding each student's emotional state for teachers, and they can also gauge motivation, um, and focus. So it alerts students to get their attention back when they are off track. Pretty massive, really. Um, we, all, all of us, I think, we all interact with machine vision in various um, end user applications like uh, automatic image organizers. For example, um, and this Im these images are from my own phone. Uh, my sister has had a dog last year and she's very dear to our family and everyone has a picture of her. And uh, when I want to show someone a picture of her, I simply write dog into the search bar of my phone's photo app. And uh, apparently I have 75 photos that can be related to the concept of a dog. And to my convenience, the machine vision is so elaborate 
52 of them are detected as poodle dogs. Um, and we also interact in our daily lives with photo filters of social media apps. These innocent uh, uh, the marks, um, these innocent face recognition apps entertain us by making us look like a celebrating puppy, uh, an older version of ourselves, maybe a kitty version, a grumpy version or a fangirl version. And in exchange, uh, we supply them free data. Uh, so images may contain metadata that show where they were located and what the images contain. And according to Instagram's data policy, it may collect usage data, device information, and metadata, including the location of a photo or the date uh, a file was created. So to my knowledge, Instagram collects 79% uh, of its users' personal data and shares it with third parties, including uh, search history, uh, location, uh, contacts, and also, I think, financial information. Um, yes, I mentioned about all these uh, applications of machine vision technologies, but from the perspective of a media scholar, uh, the possibilities machine vision, um, machine vision tools, um, research tools actually present for research are also very interesting. Um, one of the uh, first such tools to use mach machine vision technologies to measure gender representation in films was the uh, Gina Davis Inclusion Quotient. It was developed by uh, Gina Davis Institute of Gender in Media and uh, incorporating these um, Google's machine learning technology, GDIQ analyzes screen appearances and dialogue length of female characters in films. Um, by detecting and tracking faces and speech. And one of the main advantages of the software is uh, its um, capability uh, to quickly analyze massive amounts of data and reporting its findings in, in real time. And um, analyzing, um, I think, a total of 200 top grossing films uh, released between 2014 and 15, GDIQ revealed that men were seen and heard nearly twice as often as women, indicating how female characters in popular cinema continue to be underrepresented. And uh, in a similar study, Jank and, um, and her team um, they analyzed films using image analysis techniques uh, following the procedural logic of the Bechdel-Wallace test. Uh, I'm sure many of you are familiar with the Bechdel test. Uh, it's, a, it's a measure of the representation of women in fiction. It asks whether a work, uh, a film, uh, features at least two women uh, who talk to each other about something uh, other than a man. And, and um, utilizing the machine vision algorithms based on emotional diversity, um, spatial temporal occupancy, intellectual image, uh, age, uh, and emphasis on appearance. So the study uh, it found a statistically significant difference in the visual representation of female and male characters as female characters showed lower values in emotional diversity, uh, spatial occupancy and temporal occupancy compared to male characters in, in commercial films. Um, studies using different methods harnessing machine vision to understand gender representation in visual culture are not limited um, to the film medium. Uh, Taylor Arnold and Lauren Tilton, they propose distant viewing um, as a method uh, within cultural analytics uh, based on extracting and aggregating semantic metadata from images uh, for the systematic examination of visual data uh, to view patterns in a corpus. So their software, the Distant Viewing Toolkit, um, it's used to identify how gender is being performed and represented through formal elements uh, present in US sitcoms uh, from, from the network era between 1954 and 1975. Um, Melvin Weavers and Tom Smith, they also applied um, computer vision techniques uh, to, to study the representation of gender displays in historical advertisements from 1920s to the 1990s. 
and uh, they, they trained a gender detection algorithm uh, using convolutional neural networks um, to, to estimate uh, whether men or women were represented in the images. And they examined continuity and change of gender displays in an extensive data set, such a long, uh, colossal cluster, really. Um, in, in all these examples, uh, we see that human investigators, they were replaced uh, with machines, uh, which uh, can perform their tasks much, much faster and more efficiently. And image analysis systems focusing on uh, gender representation, their attempts to analyze um, content across platforms, and they generate data not only for research, but also for policymaking, as well as creating awareness uh, of, of uh, this gender imbalance in the visual culture. So their common characteristic is employing specifically developed computational methods uh, based on image recognition and machine learning to perform certain tasks, to identify um, gender-related variables in diverse sets of images and films. And they replace human investigators with machines, which can perform their tasks, as I said, much faster and uh, more efficiently. Um, but we can also look at machine vision tools as objects of study. Uh, two years ago, with the call for paper of the uh, Female Agencies and Subjectivities Conference at Istanbul B University, um, I decided to look at machine vision tools of American tech giants, including um, Google, Amazon, and Microsoft, to see how they see women. And um, based on this question, I performed a very playful for me, <laughs> experiment with commercially available machine vision systems. Uh, this is still an ongoing study. It's going to take long. Um, today, major technology companies uh, such as Google, Microsoft, and Amazon, as you see here, they provide cloud-based computer vision platforms uh, to their customers uh, to, be, to be applied in multiple services. And they offer uh, free versions of these platforms um, to the general public like me <laughs> for, for demonstration purposes. And with features like automatic object and facial detection and explicit content and um, celebrity recognition, such services, they actually give us a glimpse uh, of how mainstream machine vision works uh, in the world, really, and how they provide an opportunity um, to investigate um, non-specialized machine vision technologies um, and their capabilities, their usefulness and their limits. Um, so in, in 2019, between February and March, I used uh, these free online versions of these three um, platforms um, to, to analyze women images from films to investigate uh, their interactions. and. Um, even though some they, they use slightly different terminology and they offer slightly different features, these demo platforms, they shared core features such as detecting objects, detecting faces, facial attributes, emotions, uh, printed or handwritten texts, visual content um, categorized as unsafe and creating metadata uh, for, for classification of the images. So I selected different shots from films, including women. So close-ups, figures in landscape, figures in motion, groups of women from different ages, different genders. Uh, and I looked at all these images through these systems. Uh, this is an image from Agnes Varda's Vagabond. Um, and I applied a fashion analysis uh, using Google uh, Cloud Platform. Uh, as you see here, it looks for some, uh, it tries to recognize emotion uh, on the face, um, joy, sorrow, anger, surprise, exposed, blurred, headwear, such things. And it also looks for some labels. Uh, when we look at this picture, we can also generate, with our hu poor human vision, we can also generate some labels. And we can compare our uh, labels with uh, what Google Cloud Platform generated. Like it says face, hair, eyebrow, forehead, nose, cheek, chin, lip, hairstyle, etc. There are many things. And uh, at first look, they might not be objectionable. 
another facial analysis by Amazon Recognition, uh, looking at um, the, the image, it says it looks like a face, it appears to be a female, it um, shows an estimate about the age range, it says it's not smiling. Uh, in a previous presentation, uh, Professor Fedic Cikolo says something like that I liked very much. It says it does not have a mustache, for example, or it does not have a beard. Actually, um, it, it defines the woman with, with something she doesn't have. So it's also quite biased thing. So we should put a flag here uh, for this. Uh, so Amazon recognition also um, detects objects and the scene. Um, so we see here human, person, face, uh, female, smile, portrait, photo, photography, selfie, girl, woman, lip, and many things. And this is an analysis by Microsoft Azure, a different one. Uh, it says uh, the image is a person, it's indoor, woman, portrait, girl. It also says child. Uh, it sees a cat here, for example, or um, it um, estimates the age and gender. So they're pretty much similar. And also, um, there were some unexpected labels uh, found uh, here. Uh, it says, for example, explicit nudity and sexual activity, 60% uh, for, for this close-up image. Um, I don't know, it's, it, to, to our poor human eyes, uh, it's not detectable. We can only try to deduct the reasons behind these labels. Did the machine interpret Mona's partially visible arm holding her head? Uh, in a way only vulgar adolescent humor could do. Or in this image, the, the Google Cloud Vision sees uh, nudity and nude photography, um, but there's no such thing in the picture. Or we can, you know, play the guessing games. Uh, was it woman's slight cleavage or an incidental shadow fallen on her? which forcefully may be interpreted as pubic hair. Um, the reason behind the machine's labeling of her as nude, it's not easily understandable. Um, also looking at this image, the Cloud Vision sees pornography and adult content. <laughs> I don't know, I, I find it quite funny. Is the fetishization of the French made uniforms in the early 21st century so strong so that any image uh, they appear, uh, can only be seen as pornographic. So, um, also, while most of the tags and most of the descriptors uh, the platforms recognized in the image uh, of, of, of Mona from Agnes Vardis Vagabond, they were physically observable and associable. Um, but Google Cloud Vision he, uh, sorry, I, I called Google Cloud Vision as he. Uh, Google Cloud Vision uses beauty, uh, th this abstract and subjective concept, as a tag. So, and this tag reappeared in other close up shots as well. So, Google Cloud Vision tagged every close up shot of any female character between ages 19 and 35 regardless of their action or regardless of their facial expression with the label beauty. Um, an image search for the tag beauty uh, on, on Google's own search engine also reveals some clues on its use uh, within the search algorithm of Google. Such an image, um, such a search actually, it leads to close-up advertisement images of female models and celebrities. Um, so these search results, they suggest um, an algorithmic association with the female close-up and the visual language of advertisement. Uh, and it's the original image source or context, it's not important. In other words, we can say the gaze of advertisement appears to be dominating data set of um, Google's machine vision. Um, also, one of the most common and most confusing glitches found in this experiment were the results of the unsafe content analysis. 
Google um, defines the category of racy as skimpy or sheer clothing, strategically covered nudity, lewd or provocative poses or close-ups of uh, sensitive body areas. And 12 of the 27 images from four of the five films were deemed by platforms as likely racy. Um, featuring children and elderly people and women in everyday life and in public spaces, none of the images uh, labeled as likely racy contained the indicators suggested by Google. Um, unlike the labels discussed, um, they did not even contain material to provoke such speculations. So such glitches, uh, they require our constant interested critical attention. Uh, they reveal possible biases in machine vision technologies towards images of women, which may be related to the data sets they were trained with. Um, another label um, used for the day I became a woman uh, reveals the cultural ignorance of the platform, possibly due to the lack of its data set. It uses the label wetsuit to depict the image of a young woman wearing a chador and uh, taking part in a, the, the girl, she's um, taking part in a uh, cycling race and the Google image search of, of this chador leads to a mixture of images of women in different settings, while um, a similar search for wetsuit, it leads to advertisement shots of models in sportive activities. So even though this movie, the, the day I became a woman, it, the story uh, of the movie centers around um, the difficulties of attending to sportive activities for Iranian women, and, and the black contour of wetsuits in advertisements found in the image search somewhat resembles the um, windblown shadow in the image, but the, the features of Islamic garment is nonetheless unmistakable for a human eye. Um, this ludic experiment I did um, shows that glitches, errors, and ambiguities, they generate questions and it, it provokes discussions, of course, to understand and critique uh, algorithmic visual culture. Uh, we may not know why machines see what uh, what they see, but we can question it, because uh, the thing is, we we tend to idealize, idealize um, these uh, black box computational systems as completely objective, as they analyze vast amounts of data seamlessly. They're making decisions about cultural processes based on calculations. So, even though computational algorithms have mathematics at their core. Uh, as as Tartan just by has noted, uh, algorithms are best conceived as a kind of socio-technical ensemble of um, humans and machines in a systematic relationship. Um, getting closer um, to the end of session, I want to share another thing, another another image with you. I don't know if you're familiar with, uh, with this image. This is Lena. Uh, originally, uh, it's it's a picture of the Swedish model, Lena Forsen. Uh, the, the image was uh, shot, this photograph it was shot by uh, Dwight Hooker. And this image cropped from the centerfold of uh, the November 1972 issue of Playboy magazine. And why am I showing this to you? Because uh, Lena, is a standard test image used in the field of image processing since 1973. Uh, imaging scientists uh, at, um, at the University of Southern California, they, they tired of uh, repeatedly looking at the same images and they decided to scan a photograph from a men's magazine. It was a photograph of, of Lena Soderberg, and it quickly became the favorite test photograph used by image processing researchers. Uh, this book is a very uh, good book, Proxies, the Cultural Work of uh, Standing uh, by Dylan Melvin. In this book, um, 
Mulvin says through repeated use, this image became a central reference point in the development of digital image processing and eventually an icon of the discipline. It's a ubiquitous industry standard. And by, by anecdotal measure, I think the most popular digital test image of all times. So what does it mean? It means that the way that we look at images online was standardized by engineers and computer scientists who often returned to the LENA image when they wanted to demonstrate new skills, new techniques, or new standards. And it's woven into the fabric of uh, digital and visual cultures. Um, I like to mention about this manifesto, Zen and Feminist Manifesto by Laborio Kubonix Collective. And they, they advocate that technology is not inherently progressive. There are serious risks built into technological tools and they are prone to imbalance, they're prone to abuse, exploitation of the weak. And gender inequality is a characteristic feature of the environment that um, these new technologies are conceived built and legislated for. So algorithms, they reflect back the biases in the world and they do this as a mass, at a massive scale. So, and, and um, without any control um, sometimes. And they, um, the shortcomings of artificial intelligence processes, they collectively create algorithmic bias um, by, by which human decision-making um, across different situations, different conditions can be affected from this in complicated ways. Um, focusing on algorithmic bias in computer vision systems, Joy Bolomini, she suggests this, uh, this term, it, it is being popularized, it's called gaze, to conceptualize the embedded views that are propagated by those who have the power to code systems. Um, we, uh, humanity scholars, uh, we know that re-evaluation of looking as gays uh, by feminists and queer theory uh, has fundamentally transformed our understanding of visual culture in the past. And similarly, I think, coded gays re-evaluates the objectivity of computer vision uh, towards uh, gender and race. So according to Bolomini, computational facial recognition systems, they perform as expected um, in 99% of uh, evaluations of the uh, images of um, white men, but only um, they work 35% correct uh, when they're evaluating um, of images, evaluating the images of uh, dark-skinned women. So computers cannot see darker-skinned women as well as white men, for example. Um, another researcher, Sophia Umoji Noble, um, according to her, such instances cannot be seen as glitches, just glitches. Um, so, because they are also instances of algorithmic oppression and they're fundamental to the operating systems of the web and they have direct impact on users and their lives be beyond uh, these internet implications, uh, applications. So um, by analyzing what is seen and what is not seen uh, by, by these technologies, we can evaluate the biases embedded in algorithms and um, the culture they were developed in so we can, we can question it too. Um, machine vision changed human vision-centered visual culture fundamentally, playing a significant role in managing the traffic of images, influencing the um, opinions, behavior of people in everyday life by ranking, filtering, predicting, sometimes deciding, censoring, recognizing, generating uh, all these images. So these machine vision technologies we use every day in our um, diverse uh, operations, and they're not neutral. They're not unbiased or progressive. Um, instead, they retain existing power struggles in visual culture. And um, it's hard to make sense of these complex procedures. Uh, it's very difficult to understand this new visuality. And these complex relations 
are never fixed and they constantly change. Um, so these tools, uh, machine vision tools, they sometimes provide new ways to study films, uh, television series and ads uh, that had never been possible till today. And by looking at images through these systems, we can also try to learn about machine vision too. Uh, so it's very important for us, for media scholars, for, uh, for humanity scholars to, to understand these technologies, to see uh, the cultural implications uh, of these tools. Uh, I think uh, we should discuss this. Um, yeah. I think that's all from me today. <laughs> Thank you. I can't hear you. I'm so sorry, it was uh, my mic was muted, I, I didn't realize. So Didam, thank you so much for the wonderful presentation. It was, it was really you. refreshing to listen and to follow. Gave me a lot of ideas and I have some questions that have prepared for you. But I think we have a question from the audience uh, that I just saw in the chat box. So maybe it might be useful just to firstly uh, go to us, uh, Professor Asutuncu's question about ageism. Uh, Asujam, yes, uh, I, there are some uh, biases about ageism. Yeah, also, in my um, experiments, uh, I also detected detected some problems with uh, wrongfully guessing ages. And also, I remember that when I was in uh, for a conference, I was in uh, Brussels, and there was this machine vision kiosk, kind of an art piece. And it tried to detect my age and it found out that I'm only 30. So I was very grateful, uh, but it, it's still ageism. It's, it's not correct. So, but uh, based on those uh, detection mechanisms, so people, uh, they, they need to do stuff uh, depending on the uh, situation. So yes. Um, so sorry, I just realized that my battery is running low. I just don't want to <laughs> go go off and I don't have my powers with me. Sorry. Just just when the talk is starting to get exciting, you know, like it's, it's, it's always like that with power and with batteries. Sorry. I forgot about that. Uh, can you give me a second so I can go and get sure. my... Sure, absolutely, absolutely. So sorry, uh, in, the sorry. in the meantime, in the meantime, uh, I have a little uh, question for the audience. Uh, so, if you want, wish to ask uh, Didam Hoja anything, it's now your time to prepare the questions. As Didam Hoja is away trying to find her Just charger from the laptop. A few seconds. Uh, so yeah. Uh, so if you have any questions, please put them in the chat box, and I will present them to. The demo jump. And uh, Alkan, do you have anything that you wish to ask? Do you have any notes, any questions, queries, criticisms? Yok hocam, şu anda ben dinlemedeyim. I have, I'm, I'm just listening now. I'm eating çekirdek. Uh, I'm, I'm grateful for the good presentation. Absolutely. Yeah. Eating çekirdek, is that a good thing or a bad thing? I mean... Hmm? It's always a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> So okay, back. back to Dida. Welcome <laughs> back. Welcome back, Dida. Thank so, you very much. So sorry. Uh, no worries. So I, I just asked the audience to prepare their questions, and if they have anything they wish to ask, you'll fall in the chat box. In the meantime, I have some comments that I've prepared, and I'm just going to uh, start asking them because I'm, I'm interested and I'm, <laughs> I'm looking for answers, let's say. So actually, the first one was a little bit of a comment when you were talking about blinking. You know, uh, the first thing that came to my mind was Blade Runner, actually. You know, it's the very famous test in Blade Runner that, you know, they, they check if the, the person in front of them blinks and blinks enough, you know. So uh, it, it's it's strange that, you know, Blade Runner is not a very new, you know, science fiction. So it's quite interesting that this idea of blinking is very much tied to the human condition, so to speak, and of being human, you know, so it was uh, something that came to my mind. 
But my first question is something slightly different. So when we're talking about uh, Harun uh, Farouki's uh, operative images, the, something that came to my mind is that uh, they tend to be very much used nowadays in media narratives. So we see like, you know, for instance, whenever there is some sort of a war or military operation, we see the drones, for instance, you know, like the, the, the you know, we see the cameras from the drone zooming in on the target and then you see the bombs exploding, whatever, you know. And, you know, this is something that I've noticed is, is quite frequently used nowadays, you know. And I've always felt that the reason why these kind of uh, operative images are employed in media narratives is very much related to power, you know, because, you know, it gives us uh, the feeling of, you know, looking from the top, being able to measure, quantify something. And that's very much also tied to the notion of control, you know. And building on this, uh, my first question is, so what does all of this, you know, the usage of these operative images and their, their usage in media narratives. What does this tell about the importance of these images in contemporary society? So why do we associate power and control so much with them? Actually, power and control, it's all about seeing is all about power and control. Uh, seeing is very important for survival of the species. That's why we developed our vision. As, as human species to control others, to see and to survive. So it's all about power and control and it's remediated all the time. So it's, it's so normal to, to, to see drones uh, as a representation of power. Also, um, I should maybe emphasize that all these technologies, these machine vision technologies, these facial recognition systems, also drone systems, they're all military technologies. What we, we are having in our daily lives, including internet, it's, it came from ARPANET. So the, these are all military technologies. So they have all these implications with them. So that's what we are dealing with our everyday lives. So I think we always have to keep this in mind uh, to, to, um, to have our critical view. That's, uh, that's what I think. Absolutely. I agree that it's very much related to the origins of these technologies and military systems and that they were essentially built to, you know, destroy people and to kill populations, whatever. And the other kind of interesting thing, and it was tied to another question I had, and I realized that they were kind of interconnected with one another, was related to the Tesla uh, visions that you showed us, you know, the car, cars driving. And I realized that, you know, a lot of what we see as an effect of power over there is very much related to the resolution frame, frame per second and the CPU of the image that's presented to us because you keep on seeing, you know, the frame per second changing, the resolutions adjusting and so forth, you know. So, you know, just to kind of tie this into the idea of power, can we say that in contemporary society, resolution is, is a rendering effect of power? Yeah, why not? Resolution yeah. rendering power or... Resolution, I think so. I don't know the answer, but um, I can speculate about that resolution. It's also, first of all, it's not environmental friendly, uh, but it's about power. So, um, so having all these images all the time, we are using we are using the internet, we are talking through Skype, uh, Hangout and Teams, and we are always using these um, image technologies and we are, um, basically um consuming too much energy and it's not good for the world so they're not sustainable a resolution is also um a way of um showing you know power maybe but i i don't know the answer but it's, it's, it's a good question and we have to think about it because I mean, there is, you know, the, it's it's not innocent when Tesla releases these images. It's not like, wow, look at this wonderful system we have. They want to really show that they have the power. They they are able to create these kind of, you know, experiences, so to speak. You know, so uh, I don't know. I think that there is a connection, but I'm not sure what it is myself. I, I, I completely agree with you because uh, you know, there's nothing innocent about it. They are trying to make money. <laughs> So, um, and they are trying to control everything in digital realm. Uh, if, if something is in digital realm, it means that you are in a controllable place, controllable space. So 
we have to be very careful about living. I mean, uh, be humans. We are lazy creatures. So if something or someone decides on behalf of us, we will be more than happy. If you know, uh, if you are a human resources um, person, and you're, you know, you need to evaluate uh, hundreds of uh, resumes. And if a, a, a, a machine vision system or a machine learning system can do it on your behalf, you will be happy to, you know, see the the selected ten resumes at the end. So we let this decision making uh, to the machines. So and it's easy, and we are lazy, um, but we have to be very careful because we are going to be affected by that uh, because of that in education, in policing, in um, judiciary systems, in legislation. So in many different um, areas of society. So this is a, nothing innocent about these technologies. So we always have to be critical. The point is, um, we media scholars or humanity scholars, uh, we have our distance to these subjects because they are in the realm of engineers. We tend to think that way. But actually, um, since we cannot see the inside of those black boxes uh, and we don't have the necessary research tools, we don't know what to do with these things. We have our critical view. We are concerned, but we don't know how to approach these problems. So we have to find our ways. We have to focus on these problems because they're they are there and they're coming very fast. We have to keep up with these things. Absolutely, I absolutely agree. And when you when you were talking about you know the resume selector and you know I sometimes wish that I had such tools at my own disposal. But you know what it kind of all kind of, like it all kind of contributes into this idea of I think cognitive de-skilling at one point because you know I'm going to use a simple analogy, but I think it's a more complicated version of what I'm just going to give as, a, as an example is that when we use a calculator, it's that the calculator remembers the act of you know doing a multiplication or a subtraction for us you know and you know when we increasingly kind of devote or devolve a lot of these kind of more complicated managerial tasks to artificial intelligence to machines what happens is that we actually stop we lose our ability to do these things you know and that results in a strange kind of cognitive de-skilling of some sort you know because we don't use that extra surplus that we have you know that moment that we gained from the computer doing the you know resume selection we don't use it in a very productive way we usually go on social media and check instagram or something that's not very you know you get what i mean you know that's not going to add extra additional life skills that's you know will make us more successful academics or whatever so maybe one way to look at it and this is a very kind of you know italian uh, what's the name operatismo kind of you know approach to thing but the idea of you know, exploitation and of cognitive de-skilling could be interesting. Yeah, I find this very interesting, really, cognitive de-skilling. Um, you know, when I was writing my PhD dissertation, I was uh, I, I read lots of things about media fears, uh, beginning from Plato's Phaedrus, uh, people get scared of new media. They're all the devil's things. Uh, for example, Plato, um, uh, in in Fedoros, he, he he was afraid of um, writing because writing at that time was a new technology, and they're afraid of writing because he, in Fedoros he says uh, people um, will uh, forget everything; they will rely on um, written word, and you cannot control written word. If someone reads something, you cannot control their mind. You cannot be sure if they understood what you've written. So. Um, Today we, we find it funny uh, when um, you know the, the Don Quixote or um, you know all these characters in in the history they are afraid of um, they they read books and they got they turn mad so this is another fear a book a new another new media and people get mad after reading too much uh, when I was a kid, my grandmother would always warn me against television. It's going to hurt my eyes. Maybe she was right. I don't know. Uh, and, uh, you know, 
changing our minds and cinema, same thing, uh, computer games and same thing. We are, we have all these media fears, but at the same time, uh, I think it's more than cognitive skilling. It's really about laziness. We are not going to be the skilled maybe. So not doing it could be a good thing, but we will be happy if, you know, when I'm grading my students' papers, I, I'm sure you would be, you would agree with me. Sometimes you say, oh, just someone grades the general so I can put some extra marks. Wouldn't be great. No, it's not great because, you know, it's, you, the, the machine cannot act in the same way like we do, but once we used to that, we can continue with this thing. Absolutely. Sometimes I really feel that when I'm grading papers that I feel more like a RFID scanner than an actual instructor, you know, when I just look at like certain words and certain things. Uh, we have a question from Alper Hoca, Alper Gakyus. Yes. So, um, yeah, I, I can see. I think uh, our project asks, isn't the bias of the machines also our bias as users or clients? It seems very obvious in the images linked to the Google search beauty. It would be programmed if the users were not happy. Yes, absolutely, because that's our responsibility. It reminds me the Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, basically. Um, Frank, um, the monster, I mean. Uh, Frankenstein creates this monster and... Um, this monster is his responsibility. He doesn't teach him. And then the monster goes away and it learns from humans. And then at the end, uh, kills. So we should be responsible. We have to um, train our monsters. We cannot leave them alone. So that's what I think. Yes, we should we should reprogram. We should be responsible. We should be aware of these problems. So this is the first step, I think. And we should find ways of doing things. I mean, uh, in this uh, world of big media corporations, so vectorialist, we can, how can we reach to Google? How can we reach to Amazon as single users? You cannot quit using social media that easily. So how are we going to deal with these things? These are big questions. I don't know the answers, of course, but we have to ask because these are really important affecting our lives. Absolutely. Erkan Ojam, did you want to say something or did I just... No, I'm just eating. But uh, uh, Did Didam, you mentioned... To, uh, I mean, uh, um, so uh, you already, I think, started to mention, but so uh, like what kinds of country strategies are there uh, in, in addition to increasing awareness? Like, to be you know, honest, mm -hmm. increasing awareness, <laughs> I mean, um, we, people should know about things when you are using Instagram. For example, you have to know that they are taking 80% of your personal data and they're sharing it with third parties. And it's a, when you're using WhatsApp, Facebook, Instagram, they're all sharing information between them. So you have to be aware of it. Uh, and on a policy level, as, a, as an individual, I cannot uh, fight with companies. And I know I need those services. But these are companies and uh on a policy level, we, we, we have to rely on governments, maybe. So people, there, there has to be some policies. So first of all, we need to be aware of these problems. We cannot rely on artificial intelligence. It's not that intelligent. Artificial intelligence is not that intelligent. And we tend to think this is a way of saying things. So it's so intelligent. So we can rely on that intelligent thing. But actually, it's not that intelligent. So. Um, and we are losing the control then. So maybe personal. Uh, Ten uh, years sorry. ago, I, I was I relying see. on media literacy, but today it's it's different. You have to be aware of things, and you have to ask for things from those companies because we are losing control. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, well, thank you. Uh, so you don't observe much about institutional counter strategies. I don't know. Like maybe. Now, after some public opinion 
uh, uh, or public uh, frustration uh, corporations big tech is sort of trying to change itself can we say about can we say something about it or no not yet actually uh, i i'm not studying the policy on the policy level uh, mm -hmm. stuff i was i'm i'm in the complaining side uh, but we have to find a way for it really i i cannot imagine how we can deal with these companies you know we, because we cannot easily quit those social media accounts we need them uh, but they also need us we, but we are free freely exchanging our data just for those services we are giving our personal data freely we have to ask something in exchange for it because you know they, they are using all our data with the advertisers with third parties and they are getting bigger and bigger and we freely give them away and these are very important these are our identities and um, we should find a way we have to work on that more uh seriously i think so i'm at this position i don't know the solution yet but looking at these things i see that there are problems and if we don't do something we are going to be surrounded by all these technologies and controlled so harshly at the end especially the ones uh, like us living in authoritative countries so authority authorities can use these technologies so easily they are accessible now so um so we have to be uh we have to consider these things uh, as early as possible i think it's a little bit pessimistic i know <laughs> but still but thank you yeah thank you if if yusuf Hoja is watching i think his answer would be unionize as, as, yeah. as users, this is a, that was this uh, classic idea. Uh, yeah. Didam, I, I, I kind of I have another question to ask, and it's slightly off on a different topic, but it's something that I think is a worthwhile discussion and I find quite interesting. Is that you know it, it kind of I want to push back the pull back the discussion to this STS problem that you just outlined quite eloquently with the machine vision tools and raciness and, you know, all these cultural biases, because quite obviously, I mean, machine learning is very much dependent on data sets and on manual annotations. Mm -hmm. So obviously when, you know, the biases that you detected or the glitches are very much the kind of normativities of the engineers that are programming these things. So, and I was just about to say, it was, is it glitches or, glitches or is it something else? And you very nicely brought out uh, Safia Noble. Uh, from that, maybe one thing that I can add is, you know, is it possible to talk about machine normativity? Machine normativity. Uh, yeah, so like, you know, like heteronormativity or that there's, the, there's this normativeness about the way machines see or process images, you know, and I think that might be a funny or interesting idea to play around with. Because, you know, this idea of raciness and, you know, I, I really felt like the, the machine or like the images, the, the, process, the, anal the analysis that you were showing was like a very modest kind of conservative man, so to speak, that was like analyzing it. So there's a normativity that, you know, can maybe kind of push, you know, as a fun idea, you know, machine, machine normativeness. It's interesting. As you said, um... It's about data sets, how we are training our machines with. If you are training them with the normative ideas, so it would turn out something like that. Uh, for example, I, I um, there was this app, Google Arts and Culture. Uh, they had this um, interesting um, app. It finds your doppelganger in art history. You know, the Google Arts and Culture, oh, yes, they, they, they digitalize all the um paintings in old museums and they find your doppelganger in art history you take a selfie and you upload it to the system and they find um your doppelganger and uh it's quite fun to use it uh, they're gathering so many factual data thanks to that uh but um at the same time some of the people especially uh people darker skinned people uh, asian people they were not happy with the outcomes uh with their doppelgangers because the dark skinned people mostly matched with slaves uh, and the asian people mostly the women uh, they they were matched with geishas so because the training data the art history itself was um, 
biased. So that's why the outcome is biased too. So structuring, engineering these systems and also the training data is very important. We have to be sure of our data because it also reflects things. So it's just a vicious cycle. We have to get find a way to get out of that cycle. I think but this is a very good thing, the heteronormativity problem. So how machine you know, normativity, normativity or whatever. So like machine normativity, because yeah, you, you're very correct in pointing out that it's very much based on the archive, you know, and then there that's, that's another problem in itself. You know, I think about there is the archive fever, all of these kind of things. And it's very much tied to the problem of Western knowledge and mm -hmm. epistemologies. Mm -hmm. Particularly in the realm of things like art history, which is, you know, has a very linear kind of, you know, explanation of how, you know, Western art came out, quote unquote, Western, you know, Eastern art, whatever, you know, Asian now they call it, you know. So, yes, I think that's a very good point. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for this very uh, eye opening questions. Uh, yeah, so I guess, I don't know, uh, Arkanojam, do you have any other uh, things you wish to point out no. or ask? Yeah, it was a very intense uh, presentation thing that did them. Thank you, really. Thank you very much. So really benefit from it, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for, for inviting me. It was, it, was, it was wonderful, as always, to listen and learn about these things. I have... Uh, one last, maybe it might be useful to turn to the audience and ask one last time if they have any questions that they wish to ask Dida Moja. So any last questions, criticisms, queries, I don't know. <laughs> it's even later in Istanbul, right? Thank you. Yes, yes it's, it's, it's almost 20 past eight. I think, I think we just have somebody showing their... their Appreciation. So that was a thank you from Sekejik3232. Okay. Uh, and from Astoja. So, uh, Didam, thank you so much for you. taking the time to, you know, be with us today. It was wonderful listening to you. Uh, Arkan Ojam, thank you for thank giving you. up your class time today uh, for this Domino lecture. So I guess this is it for today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very and much for inviting me. Bye. See you later, hopefully. Bye. Bye.